Hello everyone, Sunyan here, and I'm going to start us off with a very general statement. Our education system, particularly schools and especially public schools, are just not very good. They're buggy and suboptimal, to use my usual technical language. And I don't arrive at this conclusion too easily. My life has been education uh, in the past five years. I did a DPED, taught in a public school, started an, an educational business, and... I did some interesting things, especially with uh, technical education, making programs for gifted children and consulting in schools. And this is more or less the conclusion I arrive at. And if I'm honest, it's not an all that original conclusion. If uh, you've seen either of these two viral YouTube videos, uh, you will see people, um, young people, tell you with a lot of angst what they found missing and wrong with school. If you're more academically minded or a teacher, you will have probably seen this one. It's a wonderful uh, TED talk by Ted Robinson on why he thinks school kills creativity. And if you thought about it and for any length of time, you probably will have come up with hundreds of reasons. And, and it, it's a very complex problem uh, on how to make schools better. And I personally think that we should begin from a premise uh, that may be a root of at least a majority of the problems. In my opinion, this is school is not and never was designed to make you as smart as you can be, which brings you to a question of what was school designed to do? Well, let's start um, with the question. The school system as we have it has originated in Europe. Um, it was e exported from either UK or whatever, Great British Empire, or Germany, pretty much all around the world. And um, to, to ask ourselves what was it initially designed to do is to go down a journey of, you know, 2,000 years with hundreds of heroes and hundreds of villains. But I'm going to try to do this in as simple form as I can and say the history of schooling and educational institutions in Europe uh, will have happened in five steps. So first we had the ancient Greek schools and universities, followed by the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages for over 1400 years, followed by the Enlightenment and the rise of the nation states. Then we had the Industrial Revolution and finally we are in the modern age or today. So let's start at the beginning and boy was it a good beginning. Greek schools and universities achieved a level of knowledge that was unsurpassed for over 1500 years. And it all started in a rather basic fashion. Um, children, well, I guess boy children of landowners, had uh, a very informal initial schooling which consisted of their families hiring a tutor for a number of kids and the children learning reading, writing and the, quintessential Greek literature. After about four years of this, if they were intellectually inclined, they went on to become an acolyte of a philosopher, and a bit like an apprentice, or to go to a Greek university. And these Greek universities were pluralist in their nature. There were uh, many varying and competing ideas. So some of the more popular ones perhaps were the, the Platonists, which were quite metaphysical, spiritual, and believed that ideas were the height of all human knowledge. You had the, the religious folk that believed, you know, the Zeus and the pantheon of gods. And you had the Aristotelians, which are like the modern day scientists. You know, they were empiricists, they categorized everything, and they, they invented logic. And these groups were all competing, and so all ideas were under attack at all times, and everything was discussed. And, 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 and this system, where you had a plurality of ideas, you had continuous debate. And this leads to a kind of evolutionary process of Greek thought, where, you know, ideas are constantly examined, and the bad aspects are discarded, and the good aspects carry on. And, you know, this is why Greek thought is unsurpassed in Europe for thousands of years. And perhaps a symbol of all of this is Socrates. Interestingly enough, we don't even know if Socrates was man or a myth. He might have been made up by Plato. He might have really existed. And what he stood for on the surface sounds fairly moderate. 
you know, uh, and an examined life is not worth living. True knowledge exists in knowing that you know nothing. To find yourself, think for yourself. And Socrates died because he thought for himself. He was executed by not going along with the dogma of his age. And so perhaps the lesson for us all today is don't let other people think for you. Don't just believe what the news says and don't ever believe anything so strongly to the point where you want to impose it upon others. The world of knowledge is infinite and we are always in a state of ignorance and the best we can do is just decrease it. So we move on to the next phase where the Catholic Church was the dominant institution in Europe throughout the Middle Ages, which is almost 1500 years. And as such, the Catholic Church was pretty much at the core of all the educational efforts at the time, which for the most part went nowhere because, as I said earlier, we failed to surpass the Greek knowledge. So what was the issue with this? Well, I would say there were two. Uh, first one is, with most of Europe being Christian, um, and the church having most of its power by interpreting the Bible, um, even though education was sort of very religious, there was a, an issue if a high amount of population became very literate, then they may decide that they can follow the religious teachings without having to rely on the church or go to the church or give money to the Catholic Church. So that's why, um, that's what happened with the Protestant movement, you know, in Germany and Prussia. And, you know, this, there was an anti, there was an incentive to not educate the population, first of all. And second, when it came to the higher institutions, they were exclusively run by orders of monks, like Florentine, Benedictine, Jesuits. And they had an approach to their learning, which was very, very counterproductive. So they took this Greek knowledge of um, grammar, logic, rhetoric, which essentially meant, uh, you know, a simulacra of, of, of detective work. Uh, you know, grammar, you gather the facts, uh, logic, you come up with a theory that integrates all these facts and rhetoric, you come up with a persuasive language to convince other people of your theory. Now, um, the way that this was taught in, in Catholic educational institutions was you come up with a theory first and the theory involved uh, something divine and holy. But if the theory comes before the facts, then the inherent contradictions never get discovered because you only look for the facts that match the theory and not for the facts that contradict the theory. And so, you know, in a way, this really, really um, hampered educational progress. And, and, you know, I wonder if this was done on, on purpose or not. So to give you an idea of perhaps, you know, the most indicative person of this age, have a look at this guy, John Amos Comenius or Jan Amos Komensky. Um, it's a sensational story. You've probably never heard of it. I suggest you Google him. So he lived in 1592 to 1670, and he was uh, the greatest European educational mind of his time. So some of his ideas include, he believed that finding out how the world works is akin to worshipping God's creation. Essentially, that learning is the highest form of existence. He thought that education should be as enjoyable as games and that it should last a lifetime. He thought that the mother was every child's first teacher and because of that every uh, all women in Europe should be educated. He opposed greed, fashion, self-obsession and people's lack of faith and if you can believe it this guy was persecuted by the church. Uh, the church essentially told the Habsburg Empire, that's where he lived, um, to persecute him, uh, had his books burnt, and he was a refugee, I think, in five different countries. He went through a lot of tragedy, uh, deaths of wife and children, and even though, you know, he was taken in, I think Sweden especially uh, lend him a hand. He was never really allowed to establish a school system based on his ideas. He was only allowed to train the elites of the countries uh, where he was taken in as a refugee, which kind of tells you the idea, uh, the, the notion of 
who and what established educational institutions in Europe over thousands of years. It wasn't guys like John Amos Comenius with sensational educational ideas 400 years ahead of his time. Uh, it was people that had power and wanted to maintain their institutions. So let's move on and have a look at the Enlightenment period. Now the Enlightenment period was a much better time than the Middle Ages and uh, it sort of begins with uh, interactions with the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire and, and sort of the Muslim empires and, and, and the Crusades that preceded that. And there is uh, an arrival back to Europe uh, of Greek knowledge, which begins essentially to, to bring down the Catholic Church and to, to bring out the ideas that, you know, um, people should think for themselves and so on. It, it leads to the French Revolution and then the elimination of the French monarchy. And perhaps the most important person of the age is Napoleon. But since this is a presentation about education, I will tell you the most important person that influenced education. His name was Johann Gottlieb Fichte. I hope I haven't butchered it. So Johann Gottlieb Fichte was a writer and I mean the best way I can describe him is he was an ideologue whose ideas um, were at the foundation of the Prussian or German educational system. So what really happened and why his ideas were taken on board so strongly was Napoleon invaded Prussia and he won this crucial battle, Battle of Vienna in 1806 and what happened was that all the intellectuals got together afterwards and it turned out that you know even though they had an army that was by every metric superior to Napoleon's they lost and they concluded that they lost because soldiers were not fanatical enough they were not willing to die for the country and they were not following orders and uh, they had the idea that once one way to establish you know an army uh, that is both obedient and fanatical uh, willing to die for the cause would be to have a universal school system. And this guy laid down the ideas for this system and here's a couple of quotes from the man himself. By means of the new education, we want to mold the Germans into a corporate body which shall be stimulated and animated in all its individual members by the same interests. So everybody should think the same. Bottom line, I should reply that the very recognition and reliance upon free will in the pupil is the first mistake of the old system. So we eradicate free will, we make everybody think the same, and uh, I think the third quote is similar. Uh, the new education must consist, consist in essentially this, that it completely destroys freedom of will and the soil it undertakes to cultivate and produces on the contrary strict necessity in the decisions of the will, the opposite being impossible. Such a will can henceforth be relied upon with confidence and certainty. So there you have it. And you're probably thinking, okay, uh, making a school system on the basis of, of obedience and patriotism, surely this failed. It didn't exactly. It turns out quite the opposite. They had a three-tier educational system and only 95% of the population received an education that was basically focused on obedience and, and having correct attitudes and absolute sort of worship for the state and patriotism. 5% received, roughly 5%, more like 4.5% received the technical training, so doctors, engineers, lawyers, career civil servants, and half a percent received a sort of uh, an education that teaches one how to think, how to debate, how to examine ideas. Now, I bet if you've heard of this for the first time, you're probably thinking, you know, this is an oppressive system, this must have failed. This must have been really bad. No, this was the most successful educational system, perhaps in history. Um, it laid the foundations for Prussian success over the next hundred years. Uh, about a hundred years after the establishment of the school, Germany was by far the most powerful country in Europe. They fought this, the First World War uh, against all the other superpowers and it more or less ended up in a draw. This school system was copied by United States. Many people came to Prussia um, to learn about it. It was literally copied and pasted by Japan, including the Prussian 
constitution. And Japan became a world superpower in about 50 years. So you have to face the fact that, you know, if 95% of people are obedient and, and motivated, you know, by patriotism or some other myth, that we humans achieve great things. There is a problem with it, of course, because 150 years later, you have Adolf Hitler. And you have 95% of the population trained to be patriotic and obey. And then you have hundreds of millions of dead people. So um, that's kind of the two things you need to balance in your head. Uh, you know, obedience works out on a large scale to benefit countries. It's just bad for you, the individual. So next, we move into the Industrial Revolution. Um, and, you know, human life in Europe and the West changes for good. Uh, now most people work in factories. And the people that work in factories are usually quite highly skilled workers. You know, they're building complex machines, cars, railroads. And they have, they use complex skills. And even though they use certain blueprints designed by engineers, that the workers themselves have a lot of power. Uh, because, you know, they go on strikes and they, uh, the unions are very successful because the factories and the owners really need the workers. And at this point, sort of midway through the Industrial Revolution, the, the literacy rates are high and the educational life of the masses is pretty good until this guy comes along. His name is Frederick Taylor. And he's the father of scientific management. And what he essentially does is removes any need for complex or advanced skills in, in factories on behalf of 95% of workers. He breaks down complex tasks into simple operations and makes workers just do boring, repetitive tasks. And all of a sudden, uh, there is no need for analytical thinking or complex problem solving on behalf of, of the vast majority of uh, the population and all they really need to get out of school is you know obedience and an ability to spend 30 40 years of your life doing a exceedingly boring job which uh, you know if that is the need of the industry for schools you can imagine that has some effect on what the schools turn out to be so here we are the modern age today and we can only actually see the modern age for what it is, for what school is today, if we consider the last 2,000 years. We had, you know, a thousand plus years of the church imposing its dogma on everyone and making sure that whatever worldview anyone had, had to have Catholic Church as the pinnacle of it. Uh, the Enlightenment, which uh, meant the, the, the propagation of very positive ideas among people on the street, meant uh, uh, the opposite for the average school, because we had the rise of school systems based entirely on promoting obedience and patriotism. We had the Industrial Revolution, which really led to a, a no need for higher order thinking by 95% of the population. And the school system was more focused on, on making everybody passive and docile and, and, and a good consumer so they could survive a lifetime of boring jobs. And we have a system based on all those things, and we have it in here today. And I will talk a bit uh, after this about all the, the various stakeholders, but I suppose the best thing about the modern age is that for the first time, there is no nefarious force pushing education in some direction. There literally um, are a number of stakeholders and most people involved in education are genuinely trying to make it better. Um, but it's, they're not pulling it off. And I'll give you an idea of, of, of how great ideas really don't go very far, even today. Um, let's have a look at this guy, Jean Piaget. Uh, Google him, he's a very famous uh, child psychologist. He's the guy that figured out for the first time in human history that really kids don't think the same way as adults. They go through developmental stages. And perhaps um, one of the first people in history to... to be able to create replicable experiments to show how children progress. Um, he also studied children and games, and he discovered that um, children internalize, meaning before they get articulated, they instinctively know how to play games, and games that involve both 
competition and cooperation. So funnily enough, we don't do much of sort of, that's like team sport. We don't do much of that inside the classroom. But nonetheless, his sort of four stages of development is something that every, um, everyone learns in a diploma of education. And th the whole purpose behind it was to show that almost every child eventually arrives at a point where they can uh, think in abstractions, where they can think in a fairly advanced way, and that we should not rush this. Um, you, uh, every child or every adult for that matter, understands the world using by putting together metaphors from the ideas they already have. So a young child cannot really understand subatomic physics when they have nothing similar in their life experience to subatomic physics. And the way Piaget's ideas are implemented, um, well, they're, they're not. 80% uh, of academics consider themselves constructivist, which is a term coined um, for people that believe in Piaget's ideas, but at the same time, they practice something called a zone of proximal development, scaffolding, developed by this other guy called Lev Vygotsky. And the idea here is that, you know, we help children problem solve by showing them in steps. So let's say instead of you having to understand what an equation is and figure out how to solve it, you're given two strategies and you're given four steps and you follow those steps and you solve it. Well, you can get an A. I know this from personal experience. I mean, I genuinely didn't understand most of algebra and coordinate geometry until university. And I always had an A in maths in my life. You can get, by following algorithms and steps and scaffolding, you can simulate knowledge. It's a pretend knowledge. It looks like you understand, but you're just following steps people told you. You're not genuinely understanding. And, and this predominates all across education. And um, yeah, just that, that should give you an idea. Now, in conclusion, where are we today? Well, school has a number of stakeholders. We've got corporations and what corporations want is standardized testing. Uh, we live in a service economy. Everybody should be literate and numerate and they don't really need people to, to be higher level problem solvers. But, you know, in order to shuffle papers and sell stuff and I don't know, Whatever most service jobs are, you need people to to be capable of writing, reading, taking instructions, and doing basic sums. You have academia, and academia delves in what we call evidence-based social science. And evidence-based social science is uh, it's pretty close to bunk. I mean, you know, every once in a while we have valuable ideas. As I said, Piaget backed his by repeatable experiments, but. If you go to um, through an education program, I, I, like myself, I, I only ever had high distinctions and I found evidence for whatever I wanted to believe. And uh, the evidence-based approach is just people uh, justifying their jobs and the more popular of these ideas, as I said, most of which are bunk, are then implemented by the government, regulated by the school administrations and imposed on the teachers. Then you have parents. And parents want the best for their children. They want their kids to be as smart as possible. So the school, uh, to cope with parents, essentially gives them bunk feedback. We now have uh, in Australia a system where instead of getting, you know, 20% on your maths, you're put on a continual line, line from two grades behind to one grade in front. So you could literally be completely literate, not know what 10 plus 5 is, and only be two years behind. By definition, that's the worst you could be. So you could reach year 10 knowing nothing and you'll be, your parents will get a report card that say you're at a year eight level. And uh, by doing that, they've, they've essentially eliminated the parents as a problem and parents have meaningless feedback. And so what you have is a teacher who's facing the system and meaningless reports to students. Uh, they have to prepare students for standardized tests. They're told to implement these bunky methods by the school administrations created by academics who are struggling to justify for their jobs. And that's why teachers are indeed miracle workers. I think maybe one in 10 teachers figures out um, how to transcend their own poor education and uh, tick all these boxes and then give students an awesome education. So odds are 
you know, nine hours out of 10 you spend in school, you're not being taught properly. So there it is. Um, that's my take on education. And once, once more, I just reiterate, to change the system, to help the system improve, I believe the best starting point is to look through its history and then remove the axioms and assumptions and stop repeating what we've done for thousands of years and hasn't worked. Later, postscript. Um, I just had a bit of a realization, really. I do think that there is some hope even beyond some grand scale of the whole school system that would make it look a bit more like a university. Um, I tend to think that now, since you know pretty much all of the Western world, Australia, America in particular, having an introduction of a digital technologies curriculum, which pretty much asks every school child to learn how to program a computer by the time they graduate, um, is I feel that this is going to be a step in the right direction. Uh, I am definitely certain, having taught both mathematics and uh, programming, that it's much harder to scaffold uh, steps in in within programming in a way that you know children follow algorithms without understanding the subject matter i think especially since you have a especially with the advent of debugging and text based coding what you have is an absolute necessity to understand the algorithms you're creating in order to correct the errors within them so i feel that you know coding in school is the great hope for getting kids to, to really think and it will be a step in the right direction which is what motivates me to you know have a youtube channel with hundreds of videos based on coding and electronics and on that note yeah you should probably subscribe i'd really appreciate it and thank you all for listening you've made it this far and i, I really respect your uh, attention span bye